without further ado, I would go to the next uh, point in the schedule, which is our keynote by Michael schlocke Kemper, And he is an interim professor at RWTH Aachen. And he's also associated with the High Performance Computing Center in Stuttgart. And I'm very happy to hear about his presentation, um, which is Julia for Scientific High Performance Computing, Opportunities and Challenges. So let's go. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Max, for the invitation. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, really happy to be able uh, to present to you today. I'm very sorry, uh, again, that I couldn't make it in uh, person uh, due to uh, time conflicts or scheduling conflicts. Um, but given that half my family is sick at the moment, it's maybe also not the worst uh, thing that I can do this uh, remotely now. Um, as uh, So let me start uh, the screen sharing, maybe, um, uh, which at the moment I cannot do. So maybe you need to enable it. Um, but I can already get started a little bit. As Max already said, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Julia for high performance computing today, uh, specifically scientific high performance computing, and uh, share some of the lessons learned uh, that we we got when uh, we started working on HPC with uh, our code TrixiJL, and also uh, sketch a number of uh, opportunities and challenges uh, involved with Julia for HPC. Um, some of which you probably know, some of them maybe you don't know yet, and uh, maybe as a, yeah, use this as a starting point for more discussions uh, throughout uh, this conference. Um, okay, so uh, screen sharing seems to work. Uh, before uh, I, I get started with uh, talking, I want your interaction. So I hope uh, everyone can see this uh, Menti uh, slide. So I, for those of you who don't know it, it's like this little uh, survey tool. Uh, you, you can use your uh, smartphones uh, to scan the QR code, or you can just go to the uh, menti.com website and enter this um, eight digit code. And uh, I would like uh, to get started with this, uh, just to see what kind of audience uh, here is, and maybe also use this as an opportunity um, for yourselves to, uh, to figure out uh, throughout this day uh, what the background regarding high performance computing is uh, for everyone here. Um, I'll... Uh, yeah, so a couple of people have already signed up. So I'll just go ahead to the first question. You still should be able to see the um, the the Menti uh, login uh, code up here. So if you're if you're not yet signed up, so the first question is to get a rough uh, idea of who's here. Um, let's see who has run code uh, in parallel. Let's say and uh, please select the highest uh, CPU and GPU count uh, that you have used. So if you've run uh, Julia or any other code on uh, more than 1,000 cores, then you don't have to pick the more than 10 and more than 100 cores. Okay, and so the answers are coming in. Let me see. So we have uh, roughly 20 people signed up and a lot of people have uh, answered already. So the I would say the vast majority here has some experience with uh, running code on uh, more than 10 cores. So that means uh, there is uh, some uh, distributed parallelism uh, experience. There's also a large number of people who have used uh, GPUs or at least one GPU. But uh, if we look at the higher core counts, then there is not, not as much experience uh, here in the room yet, let's say. All right, thank you. Uh, then the second question I have, or I would like to, to answer, um, get an answer from you is, what? how would you rate some HPC specific qualities of Julia? So I'm not, look, I'm not talking about Julia in particular, but really regarding high performance computing. Um, so performance, okay, this is easy. User friendliness, uh, I think this is also self-explanatory. Portability is uh, how easy is it to use one code on a, one machine and on another machine. Documentation, of course, is how well is everything documented. And ecosystem, basically how, how well developed is, is everything around uh, 
the Julia um, HBC uh, world uh, in terms of tooling, community, and so on and so on. And as the answers are coming in, we see how these uh, sliders are um, are traveling. And I think what we can already see is that there is, in general, the perception that the performance is very good. So this uh, this little uh, bump here, you can see there are quite a few people say the performance is good. With uh, user friendliness, it's not as as good and. Uh, also with uh, portability, um, the numbers get a little bit lower and it's also easy to see that the opinions are very di diverse here. So there are some people think it's very good, but also quite a few people think it's not that good. And uh, similar is for the, uh, the documentation and the ecosystem. So we can see that although Julia, whenever you see a presentation of Julia, you see, okay, that's a the language designed for high performance. In the HPC people here in this room, uh, there is not such a clear opinion about uh, the HPC specific qualities of Julia. Um, okay, so last question then, is, in your opinion, Julia suitable for HPC? And here you can only pick one answer. So pick carefully. So yes, uh, or well, yes, but no. Okay, what is HPC? Yeah, I, I put this there because uh, sometimes this is also not super clear. And yeah, as the answers are rolling in, we can already see um, there are quite a few people here that uh, are convinced that uh, Julia is a good choice, um, maybe with some caveats. But uh, there's also quite a few people that uh, are asking, so what exactly is HPC or what do you consider as? Okay, we also have one person who does not believe in HPC uh, with Julia. Uh, very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to some questions later. Okay, so uh, in general, but in general, the opinion is, yes, it seems to be suitable. But the question is, what exactly is HPC or how do we define HPC? And uh, so... Thank you very much for uh, your responses. This was already very interesting. Um, now let's go. Um, let's go to the talk and uh, let me see um, if we can answer some of these uh, these questions or if we can shed some lights on on these uh, some light on these answers. Um, so, actually, the first slide uh, I put here is so what constitutes uh, scientific high performance computing, and I think this is. A very important uh, thing to consider, and it's it's uh, usually uh, under under uh, appreciated um, because um, the question is: so, what do we mean when we talk about HPC? And there exist really a, 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 plenitude, a plenitude of uh, definitions. So, for example, from Wikipedia says uh, HPC uses supercomputers and compute clusters to solve advanced computation problems. Okay. Uh, then you have the traditional HPC crowd that says, well, if you run with MPI, it's HPC, whatever you do. Then you have the extreme scalers that say, well, HPC starts if you use 10,000 CPUs or, or 1,000 GPUs. Everything below that is just, um, you know, is, is playground level. Um, and then, but then when I started with Julia and uh, got into the HPC world, there was also other answers. So um, many, uh, many people in, in, in the Julia community that I met, they uh, associate HPC with anything with GPUs, for example, or anything really that optimizes for uh, performance. So um, whenever someone is, uh, is developing performance uh, relevant code, then it's considered uh, HPC. And uh, for me, um, I think, I, I tried to come up with a, a common definition and a common definition that I will also use uh, throughout this uh, presentation. And uh, this is HPC is executing performance optimized code using distributed parallelism and or accelerator hardware. So I think it's uh, parallelism is a crucial part of HPC. Uh, nowadays, this can also mean uh, having a GPU, a single GPU. I would also nowadays consider as uh, being at the entry point of uh, uh, HPC. But distribution or, or acceleration is not uh, enough. So 
the code also has to be written with performance in mind. So just you know having a slow code and then saying, okay, I will run this on uh, 10 threads uh, to speed it up. Uh, this is not um, uh, HPC in my opinion, uh, but um, you really need to have uh, some code that is written uh, to this effect. All right, so um, there are nowadays a growing number of, uh, of Julia projects that I would consider to be um, yeah, very friendly towards HPC applications. Uh, this is just a list of, uh, in my opinion, the most uh, prominent uh, CFD or, or so fluid dynamics or structural uh, mechanics projects that, uh, that I know, at least in Julia. Uh, there's, uh, there's Ferret, of course, uh, Trixie, uh, Grid AP is very well known, but also from the Climber people, Oceanenigans. Um, there's a large uh, or there's a large effort going on in mostly Switzerland regarding this uh, stream project uh, where they run uh, where they run glacier simulations on uh, on thousands of GPUs. So there is there's a lot of uh, interest and uh, nowadays it's not just one or two, but there are actually a number of projects involved in this. So in the in the remaining of this presentation, we're still in the introduction phase. I will talk a little bit about Trixie at the beginning to give you a perspective of where what our or my background is. And then I will try to touch the, the following uh, topics. So I will be talking a little bit about computational performance, about compilation and code loading, cross-language interoperability, very important topic in my opinion, and uh, also then finally ecosystem and uh, community. So um, for those of you who have not uh, encountered uh, Trixie before, this is our um, main uh, workhorse uh, code for high-performance uh, computational fluid dynamics. It's an adaptive high-order simulation framework for conservation laws. There are about uh, 20 uh, main developers and our uh, main goals are uh, extensibility, usability, and performance. So probably the main goals for any uh, CFD or uh, CSM related project. And uh, we try to be um, open towards, uh, we try to integrate as, as good as possible into the Julia ecosphere. So we don't, uh, don't write all the code ourselves, but we use, for example, ordinary DVQ for time integration. Uh, we use, of course, MPI for uh, parallelism, for parallelization or uh, polyester uh, for uh, multi-threading. Uh, the the Trixie uh, framework community has has grown over time, so there are now um, quite a few people working actually full time uh, on or with uh, Trixie. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, third party funded scientists already, and uh, there's also quite a lot of uh, student activity going on. So uh, I think something that many here in the room can appreciate is we, we try to make the code as easy to use for uh, students as well, such that we can have uh, master thesis, bachelor thesis also contribute to our overall um, project goals. Besides Trixie, uh, th this is basically the first code we started. There are two other projects going on uh, nowadays. We have a particle code, which is uh, not yet uh, uh, released publicly. Uh, which uses uh, quite different methods. And there's also a project, uh, Trixie Shallow Water, that attempts to take some parts of Trixie uh, and, and spin them into a separate project, but this is uh, still ongoing work. Uh, yeah, some acknowledgements. As I said before, we received some uh, funding uh, from a number of uh, research agencies. And uh, since uh, uh, last week, basically, we're also um, uh, an affiliated project with uh, Noom Focus. All right, so uh, enough of the of the of the boring uh, chit chat. So, what kind of simulations are we looking at, uh, or what what are we doing with Trixie? So, this is a typical example: um, a simulation of a front-facing step. So, some flow is coming here from the left, uh, going to the right. And uh, you have this uh, step geometry here. So you have this uh, shock forming um, because it's a, it's a supersonic flow at Mach uh, 3. And then you have this shock separation, but you also have this um, shock shock interaction here. You see some, um, you see some uh, instabilities developing here. And what you can also see is that we uh, put a lot of emphasis on adaptivity. 
So you can see that the mesh uh, adapt, uh, adapts uh, to where the interesting stuff in the solution is going on. And uh, so in order to, to try to save on uh, computational time. Um, this is a similar example. Um, this is a, also a supersonic flow uh, with a, a curved adaptive mesh. So here we can see uh, the walls here. This is a very academic example, I have to admit. The, but the walls are basically a sinusoidal curve and you can see how the mesh also is able to very um, uh, accurately represent it. And I actually have a, have a video um, for this. I just hope that it plays all right. No, uh, let me see. Okay, so we can see um, what's going on here in this uh, simulation. Um, as the flow develops, maybe we can uh, stop here. We can see that we have a lot of uh, shocks forming here at these outer walls. And then we have this sort of wake region behind the cylinder. And you can see again, that's the mesh here in the lower left adapts accordingly to the, where the solution, where interesting things are going on in the solution. And on the right, you see two indicators uh, also plotted. The lower one is the AMR indicator, which basically says, where do we need higher resolution? Uh, and the top one is a shock capturing indicator um, that helps us to keep this uh, high order simulation stable. Um, besides these uh, more academic test cases, um, we also look at more applied uh, problems. So this is, for example, the simulation of a baroclinic instability on a, on a cubed sphere mesh. Uh, this is an ongoing offered, uh, effort in, in terms of uh, a project where we look at um, uh, system modeling. And uh, another, um, another project, uh, that this is uh, regarding the shallow water equations, is going on where um, uh, a colleague of mine tries to um, simulate um, flooding events with realistic geometries. And uh, this is, for example, in uh, the town of Seaside in Oregon, where he used basically topographic data uh, to get a height distribution uh, for the um, for the bottom topography of the of the shallow water problem, and uh, when you uh, run the simulation, let me see, um, you can you can do these kind of simulations where you simulate a flat wave coming in and then uh, see how um, how this affects uh, the areas uh, in uh, on shore. So this is just a. A uh, very brief glimpse on uh, what kind of uh, simulations we're doing with Trixie. Uh, for those of you in the know, I mean, um, we use a high order, uh, we use a high order discontinuous Galerkin scheme in uh, space and time. So also the DG scheme is or can be considered some uh, form of finite element method. So probably uh, most of you are familiar with that. Uh, we have native support for 1D, 2D and 3D simulations. Um, on a variety of different meshes. So we support structured and unstructured meshes. And uh, yeah, the highest the highest level mesh is basically the P-Forest mesh where we have uh, unstructured and uh, adaptive, uh, adaptively refined uh, uh, simulations. For the discontinuous Galerkian discretization, we put an emphasis on energy preserving or entropy stable uh, split forms uh, to get uh, nonlinear stability. I already mentioned the shock capturing, uh, and we also have some ongoing efforts to put uh, modern uh, positivity preserving limiters uh, into play. Regarding the supported equations, uh, most of it is uh, still hyperbolic equations. We do have uh, had for a couple of time, for some time now, the ability to also run uh, hyperbolic parabolic problems such as uh, Navier-Stokes equations. <laughs> Uh, but this is, uh, I would say, not yet the, the prime focus. And uh, we use hybrid parallelization with uh, MPI and multi-threading. Morning. Morning. Uh, I hear someone else talking. Was this a question or? No? OK. I'll, I'll just continue. Otherwise, just. Uh, yeah, I don't know this for someone from uh, Zoom, so just ah, go. Ahead. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. Um, 
All right, finally, um, some words about the structure of Trixi. Uh, we try to design uh, Trixi both as a library and as a framework. So we, we try to be very modular about it. Again, this is probably not something, uh, I don't have met any, any code that claims that we use a non-modular structure. So this is maybe not very surprising, but uh, the equations, the mesh, the actual solver, and also the initial condition, boundary condition, they're all separated and uh, developed as uh, as independent uh, Julia entities. And the motivation, of course, is that this allows uh, a user to basically pick anything they like from what we have uh, already in, in Trixie GL, um, uh, have, have a complete simulation setup uh, running with only the stuff that is in Trixie GL, but on the, at the same time be able to, you know, go in and change any little piece and any little part uh, without actually having to modify our code, but just by using uh, Julia's um, um, uh, multiple dispatch capabilities to, to introduce their own methods, their own equations, and so on. Uh, for this reason, we also make heavily use of the uh, callbacks. Um, for those of you who work with ordinary diffie queue, uh, know what it is. So basically, this allows you to call either in every time step or every uh, stage, uh, call different um, different functionality and things like filer o amr or um, in situ visualization is all implemented as callbacks with with the goal in mind that the user only has to see the kind of code that they're actually. Uh, want to use so there is no large uh, time step loop where everything is encoded with if conditions but they can just uh, if you want a new functionality you can just uh, add a new callback and and have this uh, have this added without touching the existing code and finally um, this is what a typical elixir that's how we call these uh, simulation setups looks like uh, you basically create a, an object for the compressible Euler equations. Uh, for the solver, DGSEM here, you create a mesh, and then you throw everything together in this semi-discretization object uh, from which you can then create an ODE problem and then solve this, for example, with ordinary DFEQ. And then finally, of course, plot it either with plots or with marquee. All right, so... Um, so much about uh, Trixie, just to give you um, uh, some idea of uh, what our um, background and what our uh, motivation is. So let's look at some uh, let's look at some uh, challenges and opportunities regarding uh, Julia for um, HPC. So um, first of all, I would like to look at the most prominent and I think the most important uh, issue is, of course. Uh, the performance part when you talk about HPC, the performance is the first question. Mm -hmm. And uh, here um, we actually had a, a paper project. It's uh, already um, two years uh, two years old, uh, where we compared a high order uh, discontinuous Galerkin method with flux differencing for uh, the compressible Euler equations and the Taylor Green vortex simulation. And we implemented this. Um, we had the simulation set up both in Trixie. Uh, JL, so in our Julia code, but also uh, in the in Fluxo. Fluxo is a uh, very mature um, Fortran code. It's been around for at least ten years. Um, it's uh, highly optimized for parallel HPC. Uh, so uh, there, when when you see slides from the Fluxo or Flexi people. Um, they, they typically show that they can scale to uh, one DG element uh, per um, per MPI rank uh, with a hundred thousand uh, with a hundred thousand cores. So it's a it's a very efficient code, um, and we wanted to see how the performance of this code compares to Trixie. And as you all know, the only useful benchmark for uh, any programming language is really your own code. So the interesting uh, compare comparison that we wanted to make here is we had the same algorithms Im implemented in Julia as uh, in Fortran. So Fluxo also uses the same high order discontinuous Galerkin method. So this gave us an opportunity to have a performance comparison, not for some artificial uh, or academic uh, test setups, but for actual uh, simulation codes. And uh, then when we started out, um, we got these results. So these are for two different flux types. 
And uh, um, there are a number of uh, results here, but the interesting part is the comparison of the orange curve to the green and blue curves. And um, here lower is better. So what we see on the y-axis is the time. So less time is better. And in comparison between the, the different Trixi mesh types and the Fluxo code, we can see, uh, especially for the more expensive um, flux here by Ranocha, that the performance is very, very similar and uh, so keep in mind, this is not an artificial test case, but this is really the complete right-hand side evaluation of a full simulation setup. Um, so this is, uh, this, is a full, um, this is a full simulation code that was uh, tested here. And we can see the performance between Julia and this Fortran code is uh, actually almost identical. So there seems to be no inherent uh, advantage or disadvantage in using Julia. We then went ahead, of course, because uh, we wanted to um, we want to be greedy, and then we put in some more um, performance engineering. We did some algorithmic tuning on the Julia codes. We did some hardware tuning um, um, regarding uh, CMD optimization, and finally, we were able to actually make Trixi um, not uh, significantly, but but clearly uh, faster than the um, the Fortran code. And the key takeaway message. Uh, here uh, from my side is not that Julia is faster than Fortran, uh, please don't misconstrue this, but really that the performance depends on how much time you're willing to spend into optimizing. So, um, of course, uh, if, you, um, if you write the codes uh, just with a few lines and you make a use of a lot of high level, um, uh, a lot of high level uh, syntax, the performance might not be um, as as good as it could be, but if you if you are careful and if you optimize um, a little bit your inner kernels, then there is no reason to not use Julia for um, for applications that are very performance sensitive. So this is a slide that I always have to show when I talk to people from the HPC centers, which uh, still think mostly in C plus plus and Fortran, um, to show them yes, it's possible to do this with Julia. Okay, serial performance check. Now, what about uh, parallel scalability? This, of course, is also an important question. And for this, we did a classical strong scaling experiment. Uh, we used the same Taylor Green vortex setup. Um, and we again compared Trixie to Fluxo. Uh, this is what makes it uh, very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, here, uh, the in this in this picture the um, higher is better so we're now not looking at time uh, per per step but we're looking at degree of freedom updates per second and again we're looking at uh, at Trixi and Fluxo here and as you can see uh, that the parallel scalability from uh, um, 128 ranks to roughly 16,000 ranks is very good for both codes. They also have a very similar performance envelope. So um, Fluxo is a little bit slower, but also has this little uh, bump here. Uh, Trixie is a little faster, has a little larger bump here, but overall they both, uh, both codes uh, scale very well. And uh, I think one can, uh, one can safely say that there is, uh, that, that there is no reason uh, that uh, Julia code cannot be used in, uh, in, in parallel um, simulation settings. Uh, please note, however, of course, that I had I have not included the pre-compilation or compilation times here. So I'm just looking at uh, how this how the code uh, runs after uh, the first iteration. Um, so this is something you have to keep in mind, of course, when you do these kind of performance evaluations. All right. So when we talk about uh, performance, uh, some uh, lessons learned maybe. Uh, first of all, there is similar, or if you put in the time, better performance uh, to be obtained with Julia compared to Fortran. And Fortran is still the gold standard, at least in the HPC CPU world. Of course, algorithmic improvements are still relevant. So um, the best optimization is uh, to uh, write code that never has to run. So if you make make your uh, algorithms such that they have to do less work, that is still uh, the the prime goal uh, for any optimization. And uh, when looking at this, it seems at least that there are no scalability limits of uh, the Julia code in comparison to a Fortran code. So this is also a very nice result. 
So now let's look at the next uh, topic. Uh, and that's uh, basically the elephant in the room. Everyone is aware of this in, in Julia, uh, compilation and code loading. And uh, here the picture gets a little muddier. So uh, let's start with something very, very mundane. Uh, where to put the Julia folder? Um, as you know, Julia stores uh, its packages and everything in the Julia depot path where the package files, pre-compilation files and everything is located. And when we started out, we did some testing and the question was, where should we put this Julia folder? Uh, so we did this at HLRS and HRS has a home directory mounted on an NFS network share. Um, this seemed to be okay um, until it crashed. So when we tried to use uh, this with more than 2000 MPI ranks, it just crashed. Uh, the file system could not handle it. So that was a hard problem. But then uh, we said, okay, let's put it on the parallel file system, which is uh, which is luster based. Um, but also this is not without uh, issues because uh, for a typical uh, Julia installation, uh, a typical Trixie installation. So you have Trixie, you have um, ordinary DiffyQ installed. Uh, just these two packages, the depot grows to something like 10,000 small files. And as you're probably aware on, on most uh, HPC centers, there's a relatively strict quota limit on the number of files. Also, depending on how the sysadmins have configured uh, your um, the file system, uh, package updates uh, can get very slow um, if your depot grows uh, to large sizes, although this hasn't got much better with uh, Julia 1.8. All right, so then I already mentioned it, uh, runtime overhead due to code loading. So you always have to pay this price um, of uh, having uh, some code at least uh, pre-compiled uh, um, during, uh, during execution. Let's say, assuming you have already done pre-compilation as a pre-processing step. And here we uh, took a simulation and we ran it on one core and uh, up to 128 cores all on the same node. And uh, as you can see, uh, the compilation time is stays roughly constant. So, um, so this works very well. Um, the, the CPU um, is able to do this with 128 MPI ranks just as well as with 16 MPI ranks. But if you look at uh, the package loading time, you can see that this uh, increases significantly. So from something like 50 seconds, to uh, almost 90 seconds. So um, you can already see that there's a price to pay because um, the package loading uh, compilation uh, takes uh, takes time, but also puts pressure on the IO system, puts pressure on the memory system. So um, this is something you have to pay and you have to pay it each time uh, you run Julia in parallel. Um, a side effect of this just-in-time compilation um, I would say is also the memory usage. And uh, this is also something to be aware of. Uh, we looked at uh, Julia base memory usage by looking at the uh, max um, resident set size. So the maximum size in memory from Julia 1.6 uh, to uh, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. And I have to admit, this is a relatively um, old number. I think this was from a couple of uh, months ago. And as you can see, um, you start Julia, memory usage is still okay, but then using Trixie, memory goes up quite significantly. And once you have loaded everything and run the simulation, the maximum memory usage for a very small problem uh, goes to almost 1.6 gigabytes. So this is of course not acceptable if you want to do parallel, uh, massively parallel computations where you have a classical setup with uh, one MPI rank uh, per um, CPU and then maybe uh, additional um, hyperthreading. So you need to be aware of this uh, memory size or, or memory usage is an issue and you should plan accordingly. Um, then going back again to this uh, topic of uh, startup latency, um, I've already shown this plot up to uh, 16,000, uh, um, this uh, strong scaling to 16,000 uh, cores. And the question is, of course, why did we stop at 16,000 uh, MPI ranks? And the problem was that basically we could not go any higher anymore 
uh, because uh, the loading time starts to increase. So up to until uh, 2000 ranks, the compilation and just in time overhead uh, is, is, is okay. But then you can see just the time for using ordinary DFQ grows tremendously. So just calling using ordinary DFQ takes more than 10 minutes uh, at 16,000 ranks. So this is a different uh, machine now. This is the Eureka in at Forschungszentrum Jülich. So this is uh, parallel IO becomes uh, a bottleneck, uh, obviously. So uh, we've, we, we did find a workaround. So what we did is we, we created our Julia Depot actually not on the parallel file system anymore, but on a RAM drive. Uh, and then we triggered pre-compilation, uh, tarred the whole uh, Julia depot. And then in the parallel job, we just unpack this uh, depot on each node. So we basically take the tar file, unpack in memory, and then run Julia with the depot stored in memory. And this then actually gets rid of this uh, original problem. So with the RAM drive, this is the dash numbers. You can see that um, the loading time, they remain constant almost up until uh, 61,000 cores. So 61,000 cores is the full uh, Eureka machine. And uh, when this uh, uh, enabled us then to finally also run a strong scaling experiment to the full machine, uh, this uh, we use a larger base size here. So this is now 130 million degrees of freedom. But as you can see, there's very good scalability um, to the full uh, Eureka machine. So um, to conclude uh, this section, um, when you do parallel uh, simulations with Julia, be sure that you figure out uh, where to put your uh, depot. Uh, be aware of memory requirements. Um, also, um, make sure that uh, you know how to handle the I.O. Um, the I.O. bottleneck uh, issues. So, for example, the RAM drive is uh, one possible uh, solution. Uh, there's also a program called HPC Spindle that can help you with that. Also, uh, of course, you could consider uh, creating a custom Julia Sys image with package compiler. But this, of course, is much more involved, at least uh, from a developer perspective. But the good news is, there are no apparent scalability limits. So I think scaling to uh, more than 50,000 cores, we can safely assume that there is nothing that prevents you uh, to, from going to 100,000 uh, or even more. OK, so we have uh, talked about performance. We have uh, talked about code loading. Uh, let's talk about another topic that I think is very important, in especially in the HPC uh ecosphere and that's uh, cross language interoperability uh you're probably all aware of uh, julia's ability to natively use c and fortran libraries they come pre-compiled you get pre-compiled binaries they're bundled as jll packages it's very nice you can install them via the regular package manager and can just make use of any c or fortran library uh, you like we, of course, use it uh, for MPI, for example, or FFTW for Fourier transforms, uh, or in our case, for our mesh management, uh, we use the PForest uh, code. It's a C library, and we have a small wrapper package. When you install PForest JL, you get automatically also binaries with MPI support. It works on all machines. It's uh, very nice uh, and uh, works out of the box. So this is an extremely a uh, cool feature for Julia that is lacking in many other languages and also is a great, uh, helps a great deal in terms of um, usability. However, uh, there are some uh, caveats, of course. So um, when you go on a, on a supercomputer, you typically need to use some system API library for maximum performance. But then you, of course, also need to pro replace all the JLL provided binaries with the system binaries such that they match. And then yet still, you might get a mismatch between some system and Julia libraries. So for example, if uh, lib standard C++ does not match anymore, uh, and uh, some MPI libraries um, are known to have issues with multi-threading in Julia. So um, before you start your 50,000 simulation, uh, 50,000 core simulation, be sure to test it out with some uh, smaller uh, problem size uh, before you waste all these uh, hours. Uh, because unfortunately, as we found out, uh, the hard way is that sometimes the simulations, they just uh, stall and uh, don't do anything uh, when multi-threading uh, craps out. 
Okay, but uh, so this is already well known, but uh, using JLL packages, but um, I think we can also look uh, beyond these, let's say, auxiliary libraries and uh, go a little bit bigger. And we had, uh, we're working in this uh, project where we are using multi-physics simulations with Trixie, where we do uh, gas dynamics with uh, self-gravity simulations. And this requires us to couple our CFD solver with an elliptic gravity solver. So we're hyperbolic people. We don't light anything elliptic. So obviously the first thing we did is we reformulated as a hyperbolic problem uh, and use a hyperbolic diffusion ansatz. Uh, this works very well. Uh, and uh, we also wrote a paper about it. But then um, we wanted to use something different and use a state-of-the-art multigrid solver. And uh, we found one in uh, the DL2 library. And I don't know if you are aware of the DL2 library. Most of you probably are. It's a well-known FEM package written in um, C++. And here we were able to leverage basically uh, the the DL2 library by writing a small interface library. We called it uh, very creatively libdl2. And uh, this allowed us to basically run a parallel simulation uh, on an uh, on an uh, uh, forest mesh within uh, Julia and make use of um, the um, multigrid solvers uh, involved in uh, or implemented in uh, in DL2. So that means you can use this interoperability and you should you should use this interoperability not just for some small auxiliary libraries, but you can also use it to couple two major code frameworks together. And it does actually work quite well also in parallel with MPI and so on. Um, in another project, um, we actually go the other way around. So uh, I call it reverse interoperability. So usually we have, uh, we're no, we're, familiar with using Julia as the main program and calling into um, calling into uh, into C or Fortran libraries. But here in this project, it's called Adaptex. It's actually the other way around. Uh, so the goal is here to use Trixie as a dynamical core in Messi. Messi is, uh, is uh, a modular Earth submodel system code. Um, I don't know why they call it Messi, but uh, so if you look at the source code, you can get an idea. Anyways, it's a very powerful tool developed by a large consortium. And the idea is uh, they have an existing flow solver. It does not scale well. Can we use Trixie for that? And uh, we're actually, this is an ongoing research, but uh, the initial uh, results look uh, quite promising. Um, so we have basically this messy code. It's written in Fortran. And we created now a library like Trixie, which basically provides a traditional API to our um, Julia code. Um, because of course, uh, in, in Fortran, you cannot, uh, you cannot work with all the higher level elements that are available in Julia. This libtrixie library has a Fortran and a C interface and internally uh, calls a Julia package libtrixie JL, which basically converts these um, API calls into, uh, into the traditional um, uh, code that we use in Trixie, and then uh, this libtrixie JL communicates with the flow solver implemented in Trixie. So uh, what are the, the, the takeaway messages here? Um, be mindful of the intricacies involved when using system libraries. Um, so um, make sure that you document uh, these procedures for your users and also for yourself. Uh, especially because using JLL packages is so easy, um, it might uh, you might get the feeling that everything is easy when you use Julia for HPC, and then users might be disappointed because they find out that the HPC world is uh, has a lot of sharp edges. Um, leverage existing tools uh, where possible. Um, so not just uh, FFTW, not just uh, MPI, but also consider um, larger codes that can be coupled. And also do not be afraid of going the other way around. If there's a large legacy code that, uh, for example, wants to have some state-of-the-art FEM capabilities, well, why not? Why shouldn't they use uh, Ferret for this? Um, there is the possibility to do this. Uh, it, has, it just has not been done very often so far. All right, uh, coming to the final uh, section, ecosystem and uh, community. Um, one thing that 
uh, everyone who works with Julia and API notice in the very beginning is that there is no inherent API support uh, in the wrapper. Uh, this is ex extremely annoying for parallel development uh, because uh, every time you have to rerun your code, you have to suffer the initial compilation times. Parallel debugging is even less fun. Um, at the moment, there is, in my opinion, no good solution to this. There is this uh, package called, or not a package, a software uh, tool called TMPI, which basically allows you to run uh, MPI via Tmux. And then you get something like a parallel uh, or an MPI parallel uh, uh, REPL session. Um, it's also not optimal because if uh, if one of them uh, crashes, because MPI likes to crash a lot, if you don't do everything by the book, uh, this can be still a problem, but it is a solution. Um, another issue that um, regarding the ecosystem is that there are still some, um, yeah, there are still some challenging perspective per perceptions to battle. At the moment, there are very few precedents uh, in terms of highly scalable Julia codes. Um, and Julia still has a very mixed reputation in traditional HPC circles. Uh, this is partly due to the conflicting HPC definitions we saw above, uh, but also that um, in the early days, I would say that Julia was a little bit over-promising what kind of uh, things are possible. And uh, so the HPC crowd looked at Julia and then uh, found it does not uh, hold up these uh, promises and then uh, turned away. Also, uh, one thing that is clear, there is no money in HPC. Uh, so HPC is not a first-class citizen in the Julia ecosystem yet. Um, we do have uh, great support uh, through Valentin Churavi um, from, uh, from Julia Hub, um, but uh, there are actually not that many people from the, from the Julia Hub side involved in the, in the HPC world. Uh, so this can be uh, a challenge. The situation is a little bit different in the in the GPU world. Uh, we have um, uh, Tim Bizar and uh, Julian Samaru and uh, a few other people who, who work with the GPU stack. But in the traditional CPU-based uh, HPC system, it's mostly users who drive the development at the moment. So... But what can we do about it? So I think one of the best things is to engage in the Julia HPC community. There is a community. Uh, it's uh, very active on, on the Julia Slack in a different uh, number of different channels. There's also a monthly Julia HPC call that I just in can encourage you to join. Uh, the next one is uh, on October 24th. Um, it's also in the Julia community calendar, or um, if you if you like, uh, it's always the fourth uh, Tuesday in the month for whatever reason. Um, of course, it's always good to get involved in some of the key HPC packages um, like MPI or CUDA JL. And uh, yeah, I really recommend to check out the Julia for HPC mini symposia that have been popping up. We've had uh, one at JuliaCon, I think now three years in the running. Uh, there's one, uh, there was a BOF at the supercomputing conference. There was actually a multi-part uh, mini symposium at the uh, PASC conference in Switzerland this year. And there will be one next year as well. Um, so um, there are a lot of uh, ways to get involved. Um, also, what can come out of it for you, there was actually a joint effort to write a paper on Julia for HPC. Uh, quite a few people got involved. So uh, also, from a scientific point of view, it can actually make sense. So um, what are the lessons learned here? Toolchain and infrastructure support is not optimal at the moment. Julia for HPC is still a niche in a niche. So I would say Julia is still uh, not, uh, not, uh, not nearly as uh, widespread in use in HPC. And HPC itself is also not uh, a super large uh, community. Um, but the thing that you can do about it is to document as much as possible and disseminate information about your approach to Julia for HPC and especially also showing to the uh, traditional HPC crowd, the HPC centers, that Julia is usable and is used on their systems. And finally, um, just be aware you're not alone. Uh, if you reach out, you will get help. All right, uh, coming to an end. Um, I mentioned it in the very beginning, serial and parallel performance of Julia is on par with traditional compiled languages. 
Um, so there is uh, nothing to worry about here. Um, we have great code reuse through the binary interoperability with C and Fortran. There are a few challenges uh, with Julia compared to traditional HPC language, uh, code loading, uh, pre-compilation, things like that. Um, also, the, the parallel development tool, tool chain is not yet um, as mature as for um, other languages. But there is actually not a Joomla, but a Julia HPC community that is uh, very vibrant, and I really recommend uh, reaching out. All right, uh, this is it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, if there are questions, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thanks a lot. So are there any questions? Yeah, Christopher? Do I press the button? Or... I can hear you. Yes. No, no, no. I know. Okay. Uh, so my question was regarding the system image pack and com package compiler method of code loading. So if you use that, you only have a single file for all your packages, right? So did you do any benchmarking with that, how it scaled and so on? Because it seems like that would be scaling pretty well with only a single file. Yes. So um, we're actually running um, a couple of uh, benchmarks as uh, we speak. So one of my, my research assistants is working on that. Um, the problem with Trixi and uh, and um, package compiler is a little bit uh, yeah it's a little bit tricky because uh, package compiler does not um, support all weird uh, constructs uh, performance optimization constructs uh, out of the box. So uh, we had a lot of trouble getting it to work with loop vectorization. Uh, this has gotten a lot better by now. Um, so this is why we're actually doing it now. Uh, before we were not able to run uh, simulations at all with package compiler. And uh, if you only compile parts of it, then of course you still have to load all the other code. So I do not have performance numbers on it. I believe it's gotten much better. And uh, I hope that uh, maybe uh, next year we can uh, report that this can be a good remedy. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Mm, yeah. Hi, Knut Andreas from T. Braunschweig. Uh, I'm, this is probably a very basic question that I didn't understand, but I think on slide 18, you showed these timings uh, comparing with the Fortran code, and they both were better than the ideal line. Can you explain how you achieve that? How is that possible? <laughs> Yeah, so this is this is a classic uh, super linear scaling uh, due to um, having codes that are basically memory bound. So somewhere around this region, so so these are both uh, CFD codes, and CFD codes are uh, are known uh, notoriously known to be uh, memory hogs. Um, so usually all our computations are not bound by the CPU speed, but by the memory bandwidth, and uh, this is a strong scaling experiment. So the more ranks we use, the lower the number of, uh, of uh, elements we have per rank. So at some point we start, part of the computation start to fit completely in the cache. Uh, and at, at, at some point around here, probably all uh, hot kernels are run completely uh, in, in one of the caches. And then you see at this point, then the curve also um, you know gets flatter and then you basically get killed by um, your serial uh, or non-paralyzed parts. So this is basically uh, memory effects. All right. Any other question? Yeah, Dennis. Um, okay, you just speak. Oh, it's fine. Um, hello, Dennis Uhrmann from Bochum, and I have more a uh, meta question here. It is about um, why do we still stick to MPI? I mean, we had a chance now to get into new paradigms with Julia since we built many specs from scratch again. So um, why is there a reason why we still stick to MPI? Yes, there's a very strong reason. Um, MPI at the moment is the only game in town when you want to do HPC at the supercomputer level. So there is no serious competitor in terms of vendor support, in terms of sysadmin support to MPI. 
Um, I know there are alternatives out there. Um, some people said that uh, we should directly use, for example, UCX. Uh, there are some uh, some gaspy like uh, approaches for parallelism that uh, have been used and are used also with Junior. But at the end, the HPC crowd is, uh, or the HPC community is moving, or is, is a very conservative one. And um, if you you have so many problems you have to handle when you run at 10,000 uh, cores, that uh, usually there is just not enough energy left to experiment also with your uh, communication stack. So I would say this may be changing if the overall HPC community is moving towards other uh, means of communication. I don't think that Julia alone will have the pull to get this, uh, you know, running uh, uh, and efficiently running at scale uh, just with a Julia based uh, solution. Okay, thanks. Right, any other question? Then let's thank uh, Michael once again. Uh, enjoy the day and thank you again for hopefully next time in person.